Now this is a, a picture of Papua New Guinea at the moment where there's a drone doing uh, delivery of medicine to a remote village. And when you look at it like that, if there's a sick child or something like that uh, that needs medicine urgently and there's no other way to get to that, drone delivery makes a lot of sense, right? I don't think anyone can really complain about drone delivery in that sort of scenario. Uh, but you should have seen the same picture as Merkel had earlier on. Uh, Amazon made a lot of headlines just before Christmas season last year, talking about drones. So, uh, but uh, the principles around it are beginning to make sense. They're beginning to lay the groundworks and the foundations to get it into the psyche of people out there that at some point in the future there could be drones doing deliveries. Now, is this just a publicity stunt? Well, I think not. If you begin to look through the business models, Amazon make a huge amount of amount of revenue. The reason they don't really pay much tax is not because they've got really complex tax arrangements. It's because they actually don't make any profit, right? Because at the bottom line of Amazon, it doesn't look too healthy at the moment and generally. So they have to try to convert their big ones of revenues into profit, and delivery costs is one of their biggest things. I think Amazon are taking this very seriously, and it's something they definitely are working on. And just to prove that it's not just Amazon, Google decided to get into the game as well a couple of months later. So here's another west coast of the California technology company trying to do the Futurology thing. They've got a fixed wing delivering a small little parcel on a, on a little wire. This is in the Australian Outback. But that's okay, so California companies doing the Futurology thing, that makes sense. But you know it's serious when the Germans get involved. And this is DHL, uh, one of the biggest uh, logistics companies, and they're trying to think about this in the same way, and they're doing, uh, looking at uh, a, a yellow DHL logo and brand drone delivering DHL parcels. So, is this going to happen anytime soon? And I don't think so. Not in the next few years. There's a lot of regulatory hurdles that are going to need to be uh, overcome before we have channels and corridors of drone activity in cities. But I do think it's a matter of time. The principle is, as Virgo mentioned, geofencing, or we like to sooner say geotunneling, having tunnels through the air of geolocated drones that have the right safety elements out there, that have the right battery recharge, you know, swapping stations out there, they able to do delivery networks makes sense. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but the next five to ten years, I think it's in plan. But what is happening now? Merkel also mentioned infrastructural inspection, and this is uh, one of the use cases that I like quite a lot. Uh, and it's a, a small plane inspecting a big plane. So there's something strangely symmetric about that, and biological in a way. But this uh, EasyJet are using uh, drones to do their on-ground inspection of their fleet. And uh, this makes a lot of sense. Drones are good. They get cameras in the sky, uh, and get to places which aren't easy to access. And it's many, and looking at the top of planes, even when they're on the ground, is one of those areas. Okay, let's take a step back. So there's lots of activity. There's lots of buzz around drones. What, why, why is that all happening? We've got use cases coming out there, but one of the key drivers of this is the raw technology. Um, Smartphone technology has been one of the key drivers between a lot of things you need for drones. Um, so if you look down here, this is in 2005, 2006. You needed six different chips to create the key elements of an autopilot system. Fast forward to 2012, and it's all down on the one chip. The key components you can need for accomplished gyrometers, accelerometers, and etc. And all those other components such as GPS elements and processing power that they make up an autopilot are all components that you can find within an iPhone. This is a picture from an iPhone 4 a couple of years ago obviously now. Uh, so the, this is one of the reasons that are driving miniaturization. So one of the, and we've talked a lot about use cases of drones, but one of the other things that, that I like to bring forward is drones in very small sizes. So, uh, if you begin to look at the history of drones, and a lot of these companies technologies have deployed from military, some very big drones such as the Predator, which you see a lot of headlines on, uh, as you go up in scale, you get, this is a deck launch drones for US Navy from uh, the top of the deck of an aircraft carrier. But one of the most common drones in the in military out there is called the Raven uh, uh, from a company called Air Environment in California. That's a hand-launched plane that does over-the-hill inspections. And these things have been around for just over 10 years now, and they're very common. There's over 10,000 in use. In use. It gets more interesting as you begin to get smaller. And one of the one of the new drones that came out just a few years ago is this little mini helicopter. It weighs about 20 grams. It's called the Black Hornet. It's from a Norwegian startup company. Um, 
Now these little things don't come cheap. Uh, the UK MOD bought 160 systems for about $20 million a few years ago. And uh, so there's high value sort of little mini robots. And these are to see over walls or through doorways uh, to avoid soldiers putting their lives at risk in the battle zone. But in reality, this sort of demand curve as it goes up here begins to show the amount of use case and the amount of units that, that it'll have potential to sell if, uh, as the size begins to go down. And we think this is a strong trend, and it's a trend that we think is likely to continue. Maplebird at the moment have an interest in technology working at the scale of the Black Horn at the moment, but also with an eye to what happens at the scale below that as well. So, back to the same theme that Merkel brought up around bio-inspiration. So, if we look at, uh, as you get, begin to get small, you begin to run into some fundamental problems in physics. Uh, the best microwave vehicles out there at the moment struggle to fly stably uh, in windy conditions. And you saw Merkel's example of the rotorcopter in the forest area. But insects are seem to be capable of flying even in extreme wind conditions. And one of the best poor weather flyers out there is a bumblebee. And to give you an example of how it works, let me, uh, let me talk about why it doesn't work. So, take an example of a butterfly. Butterflies have a big wing area and they have pretty low wing beat frequency, about 12 to 20 beats a second. Now, that, may, that looks very nice when they're hovered over a cabbage patch in the summer, but if any wind comes along, they're instantly blown and taken by that wind. What uh, a bee does differently from that is it's much smaller wind, so uh, much smaller wings, so it's a much smaller surface area for the wind to act on. It also beats those wings much faster, about 250 times a second, for the example of a honeybee. And that gives you the ability to pick up and detect us and then adjust for that. Um, so that's the principle of what we do at Maplebird and the inspiration for our UAV. This is one of our initial little prototypes from about five years ago. Uh, in the top left picture you see an example which is we set a 2P coin. So this is a very small little device and this actually has a real bee wings super glued to it. Just for disclosure purposes, we harvested the bee wings from, a, from dead bees at the University of Sussex on a bee project. No bees were killed in the making of this prototype. But uh, the, the, what we've done over the last uh, four years now with Maplebird is look to scale that up in the technology using the latest uh, carbon fiber technologies, 3D printing, uh, building power and control electronics to power this device. And now we have a device that operates uh, at very high performance levels and is about palm size at the moment. So we're not fully finally, fully off the ground yet, but we've got a really strong trajectory at the moment. We're very, very close to achieving that. There's a lot of interest, obviously, in the product at that, at that stage. So I think when you begin to get into that, talking about, well, what's the point even if we can't do that? Well, I think there's a load of use cases. So in a lot of the examples we've talked about in future cities and a lot of the use cases that are coming up with drones at the moment, um, why, why is it better uh, to have a smaller device? Well, obviously, for the very obvious point, if you need to deliver big parcels, you're going to need to have quite big drones to carry those things. But for a lot of other use cases that we're talking about in cities, all you're looking for is a camera or a sensor in the sky. And if that's the case, the smaller the better, really. Uh, and that's one of the principles of which we're operating under with Maplebird. Uh, civilian services such as police and fire would like to operate uh, drones in more urban environments. And if you've got a very lightweight drone, it's not going to cause anyone injury and it falls out of the sky. That takes away a lot of the regulatory hurdles that are happening in that space. Our city initiatives that are going on out there are in prevalence and there is a lot of interest in things you can do dynamically if you have mobile sensor networks that you can begin to position. We're talking about sampling water, air pollution, etc., monitoring buildings and gases, monitor, dynamically monitoring traffic, and things where a fixed sensor network doesn't make sense, but a quickly and easy to deploy dynamic sensor network makes a lot more sense. We think small, use, small drones and use cases are good use cases for that. Infrastructural inspection, again, in bridges with big camera systems makes sense. The faster, high, the quality of cameras that you get, even the mobile phones, as you all know, are very, very high now. But the communications technology is also on mobile phones. You can have that small camera on board, beating the pictures back to a, to a base station that's doing all the processing in the cloud. The processing doesn't need to be done on board in these things. Smart cities also brings together the extra population densities in cities, brings along to feeding those populations. 
and precision pollination becomes a really interesting, potentially huge market. Precision agriculture is already a big market for drones. There's a lot of work going on in that space. But at the smaller scale, precision pollination, 25 to 30 percent of fruit crops, high value fruit crops at the moment are hand pollinated. It's a really expensive process, and we think getting robots small enough that can do that makes begins to make sense. The climate bee populations, etc. There's definitely room for that. I actually gave a talk at a bee conference a few week, uh, last week as well. Um, and the uh, Project Tango is a project that Google got on, but it came from the Motorola Group, uh, and that's. Um, in indoor, indoor mapping, SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping for a dynamic mapping of indoor spaces as well as external spaces. And what they're, what they're doing with that is putting two or three camera systems on the, again in the back of a mobile phone. So the technology is coming down and down in size and that will enable small drones to be able to carry that. Again, small drones make a lot more sense indoors. If you had a big drone sitting here and it took off, everyone would be moving back quite fast because those rotor blades turning at high speed are definitely potentially dangerous. A much smaller drone takes away that sort of imminent physical threat. And we think that if you want to do stuff inside, then this makes a lot more sense. And that leads on to doing things like assisted living. If you want to keep people in their homes for longer, you to, either you want to what, and uh, you need someone that needs to be monitored in case an elderly parent or relation falls over, either from let their children do that or from the local authorities, then that actually makes a lot of sense to have a dynamic repositionable camera within the house that can recharge and then be controlled easily. But those need to be able to detect their environment well. And there's some technologies that we have for a maple bird that enable us to do that at a better level of precision than other types of small robot out there. So there's a little bit of a, uh, of a vision around what's possible in the small robot space. Uh, gives you a quick insight into some of the technology that we've developed and some of the future use cases we think become much more enabled and much more practical when you can build really, really small networks of UAVs. Okay? Uh, thank you very much. I'll put them behind. Hopefully I'll that's good to think up a little bit. Right, well, thank you. So, um, thank you. Ben. And again, I just...